Deputy Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, real pleasure for me to be here uh, introducing this uh, now annual leadership event. Uh, my name is Mark Durkin, and I'm the uh, new Executive Dean of the University's uh, Business School. So it's a real pleasure to introduce you. I also want to make some very brief introductions just to say welcome to Fergal and the PKFFPM team uh, for the wonderful reception we had downstairs and for being so committed to this uh, event now that's such a, um, a part of our calendar in terms of what we do in the business school. Also our friends in MLN, um, to Jerry to, for coming back and, and doing this again for us. And in particular, of course, I want to also welcome Anne. The Ulster University Business School aspires to be the leading business school for entrepreneurial education, research and impact in the UK and Ireland by 2021. The impact of our research is already rated as being seventh in the UK and all of the business education portfolio that we offer is in the UK top 10 according to the National Student Survey. Now being a leader in entrepreneurial education means having a curriculum that is imbued with a focus on opportunity creation and delivering those programs in new and innovative ways. And to be honest, most important to me are behaviours behaving entrepreneurially in our attitude to calculated risk and a shared obsession with the creation of value for our students, our stakeholders and the wider regional economy. And a role model for both entrepreneurial thought and action. She's a role model for both males and females. But where Northern Ireland still has 50% fewer females than males, seeing self-employment as an option, the focus on female entrepreneurship is especially important. Leading Canadian professor Barbara Osser was on this campus around eight weeks ago talking about that very thing. And that night I committed to strengthening our focus in the business school on female entrepreneurship. And I'm glad to update you that work is progressing well under the leadership of our professor of entrepreneurship, Parikh McGowan, and many external stakeholders. Indeed, we have a further round table from the one that we had with Barbara, already planned in the coming weeks with the support of our friends in Business First. And I'm also delighted to tell you that the Ulster University Business School, together with our colleagues in research and impact in the university, are putting £20,000 towards the development of some specific thinking and actions in the female entrepreneurship space between now and the summer. You didn't come here to hear me. I want to close by thanking you for coming along to this very prestigious event, and I hope you have a really enjoyable morning. I'm going to hand over to Jerry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Would you put your hands together and please welcome our very special guest this year, Anne Herity. Welcome to Belfast. Thank you, Jerry. In your role as, as uh, with EL and, and, and with IBEC, uh, do you get a chance to visit Belfast much? I do, actually. I'm up in Belfast quite a lot now because uh, we have an office here in Belfast and an office in Derry. And uh, Anya Brawley and some of the team are here this morning. Anya is our chief executive here in Northern Ireland. Uh, so I've certainly been up quite a lot over the last while. You're from Ballinalee. I no, I've indeed. never visited Ballinalee, to be honest. <laughs> well, you should. It's a lovely village Isn't in North Longford. Tell me a little bit about your, your early childhood and your growing up in, in a relatively small town. Um, so Ballinalee is a small village in North Longford, about 300 people uh, or so. Uh, I was one of six children, three boys and three girls, and the second youngest. Um, and my mother and father ran a business there, so um, we had a local shop, um, uh, farm, undertakers, all that, and then of course my brother was also the local doctor, so <laughs> a good comp pretty much covered it all. Yeah. <laughs> and w did you work in, in the business? Uh, yeah, absolutely, from, some, from we were tiny. Um, we all had our jobs to do and our responsibilities. And then your father died and your mother con continued so, on? So, yeah, my father died uh, when I was 16, and my mother was really the driver of the business in a lot of ways. My, my father was almost like an engineer at heart, even though he never did engineering, but he loved you know, fixing things, he loved working with machinery, he loved farming, probably much more than he liked the business side of things, although he did, of course, work in the business. 
Was it ever expected that, that you would stay on and, and stay in the business and grow the business there? No, uh, we were, you know, for all the fact that my mother was a real driver of the business, she was still quite traditional. It was always going to go to one of my brothers. There was never a question. Was, educa was, it, was education important in the family? Uh, education was hugely important in the family. And my mother would have been always very keen that we would all um, travel also and go abroad. But she really pushed education hard. So you went to UCD yeah. to study maths and economics. economics yeah did you have a plan then did you know what you wanted to do not a clue <laughs> and in fact i really just fell into maths and economics um by accident and um and i pretty much enjoyed my time in ucd i'd have to say i took the scenic route um, i wasn't what you'd call the best student in the world it was there for a year or two then i dropped out for a year or two then i went back eventually and finished up so yeah. But no idea, no plan for a specific job? Or no anything? plan. Um, I thought about lots of things. Um, very quickly after I leave, left college, I explored a number of things. I looked at doing law and I started to do a law course and I didn't really stick with that for very long. I realized it wasn't for me. And then uh, I thought about teaching, but that wasn't really for me either. And then I um, eventually I did one of these start your own business courses. Um, with what was, which was the precursor of FOSS yes. and I really enjoyed that and I came up with some great and wonderful ideas about what, we, what I was going to do in terms of starting a business but I never actually got one off the ground. Um, but you discovered you had some entrepreneurial skills then. Yeah you? and I think uh, you know I would have always working in the family business at home I would have actually quite liked to have stayed in that business and I would have worked in it much longer than my brothers and sisters actually because right through college I would have every time I went back home I would have worked in the business and I really enjoyed that and I enjoyed the connection with people with the customers coming in and out and all that and I actually thought it was great fun. So you came out with a, with a BA? Yeah. What was the work prospects like in Dublin at that time when you, when you came out of UCD? Well, that was 1984 and actually there were really none um, so I really pretty much did you know, odd jobs. I worked in a record shop. I worked in a nightclub. I worked in lots of different things. And then eventually, my friends were sort of saying to me, look, you're going to have to get a proper job. And I registered with a recruitment agency. I know it doesn't sound great, does it? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a very auspicious start, but I registered with a recruitment company. And um, they had a job going in telesales with Xerox. So, so what was I, your job there? What did you have uh, to do? So I started in telesales. Telesales was quite a new thing then. So that was about 1986, I think. And um, so essentially selling over the phone. So I was selling products, consumables, paper, all that sort of thing over the phone. And of course, when I got in there, I absolutely loved it. I loved the whole idea of selling. I really liked all that. I'd find a bit of a niche. And then I couldn't wait to get out on the road and get a car. That was my next big goal. I wasn't actually making big long-term goals. It was like, all these sales guys have their own car. I need to have my own car. So, um, so after about six months, I got, uh, I got a job on the road selling typewriters. And they were huge typewriters. <laughs> I just can't imagine them. They were the heaviest typewriters on the market. They were the biggest, so every office you'd go into, the, you know, while Xerox had a phenomenal reputation and great reliability, when you'd go into an office with this big typewriter, you know, you could see the secretary looking and saying, oh, that's going to take up my whole desk. And, you know, there was just one line of memory on it and all this sort of stuff. So it had to be innovative in terms of how you'd convince people to, that this was the best product for them. Were you, were you good at it? Were you good at the sales? Yeah, I think I was actually. I think I was. I built good relationships, you know, and uh, yeah, I had some success. At it. So from sales, where did you go? You went into recruitment then. So from sales, then I um, decided. You know, I was I was looking for another job in sales. Actually, I wasn't thinking about recruitment, and I registered with a recruitment company then, which was Grafton Recruitment. I see Ken Belshaw here in the audience, who was my first boss in recruitment. And um, I registered uh, with Grafton and they said, after the person had interviewed me for a while, they said, well, would you be interested in recruitment? And I said, well, I don't really know anything about it. I don't, you know, uh, don't know if I'd be able to do it. So they said, no, join us and we'll train you. So that's really how I got into recruitment. And once I got into recruitment, I knew I had found my niche. I absolutely loved it because it combined 
the selling and influencing part of the role with that whole people and you know helping people to realize their potential and what I loved about it was you know you were very quickly you were aligned with your client you were aligned with your candidate they wanted the best person you wanted the best for the individual and um, the company wanted to see you making placements so everybody's very aligned in that way so Grafton trained you Grafton and trained to me. thank them you left them and set up your own company <laughs> well <laughs> it wasn't quite like that was it Ken <laughs> um, it, well, what actually happened was <laughs> they appointed a new manager. Ken appointed a new manager to the Dublin office, and he and I didn't particularly get on very well, this new manager. And I had an idea that I wanted to specialise in the tech sector, and he didn't, that, he didn't want that. He wanted us doing everything, so I could be recruiting somebody a uh, programmer today and an accountant tomorrow and maybe a secretary the next day and I really felt that if I could specialize that I'd build a really deep knowledge of the sector and I'd done some programming at the time uh, through my maths degree so people in the office used to come to me from time to time and ask me about you know if they were interviewing a technical person and the other thing is I found I really liked the technology people but in 89 you know, they're quite confident there, there, but in there wasn't a big tech scene in 89 was it no it was so I can understand why that you know, he didn't want me to specialize because it was a tiny market but I, I was convinced I just enjoyed working with the tech people and I thought that was the thing to do so um, eventually I was um, in fact, I met my husband, Paul, in Grafton as well. Um, he was now working in KPMG. And I was, uh, well, we weren't married at this time. We were living together. But I was going home every evening, and I was complaining about the fact that I couldn't specialize in tech and that I really wanted to. And eventually, after a while, uh, Paul said to me, look, you have a couple of choices here, Anne. He said, some of them are good, but he said, one of them is bad. And he said, your choices are, he said, first of all, you can focus on the good things in work. You'll really like Raft and you enjoy working there. Focus on the good things and forget about the negativity. He said, all oh, that negativity doesn't suit you. Now he said, if that doesn't work, go to your boss and try and convince him of uh, the merit and letting you do what you want to do and just specialize in tech and sell him on the value that you'll create for the business. And he said, if neither of those two work, your third option is to really just go and get yourself another job um, or else set up on your own and do it your own way. And then he said, finally, there's the last choice. And he said, that's, this is just not a good choice. And he said, that's coming home here every evening. I'm moaning and I'm complaining to me. He said, that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you better go and do something about it. So that's actually how, we, how I got started. So how did, where did you get the money from? Where did you get the... So I didn't have any money um, to get started. So um, a friend of mine, her husband, said he'd back me. And that's how I got started. Well, that was the start of CPL. That was the start of CPL. And so that was it was literally just me and a desk and a phone. Well, that was 1989. That was the end of 1989. And in 10 years' time, by 1999, yeah. so successful had it been, obviously, that you floated the company. That's right. Now, I, I'd have to say it was a very difficult start because, you know, unemployment was running at about 15%. So, like, intuitively, it was not the right time to start a recruitment company. And, you know, for about the first two years, I was constantly... Uh, interviewing people who were being made redundant, people with really tough stories. But you know, like all these things, if you treat people well, they'll come back to you. And um, so I was very focused on doing the best I could. And also in terms of our clients, you know, we really had to work hard to gain their respect. And I suppose at that time I learned very much to measure our success really about the clients who recommended us to others, rather than in re really in monetary terms. And um, we worked really hard through those years. And I think in a lot of ways, a recession is a good time to set up a business because you can you kind of cut your teeth and you bootstrap. And then when things start to improve, you're ready. So, and that's really what happened to us. As things started to open up then towards the mid 90s, we were sort of ready then. Well, you were lucky in many ways, were you not? Because that whole tech sector opened up in the 90s. It really, it's really become an industry that almost defines the whole of Ireland nowadays. You were the absolutely. right place at the right time. I was in the, it, absolutely lucky. And I, and I suppose that's the thing for me now. I think you've got to have luck for, you know, in terms of business. You've got to be lucky. And also, too, your, I think timing is everything. Yeah. So, you know, while I didn't know about the time and timing, I was lucky in getting the timing right. 
1999, you, you flooded the company. Yeah. Why? How, so, tell, tell me the lead up to that decision. So, I suppose at that time then, um, I worked really hard through the 90s building the business and you know it becomes all consuming really that's the reality of it and I'd had my daughter in 1994 and I suppose I had a really good team around me people who had worked with me from the outset or are still with us and I wanted to give them an opportunity to participate in some of the success of the business um, so by bringing the company public they could get um, share options and participate in the success of the company so that was one it also meant that, now at that time we were very focused on just staying in tech because that's where the market was, but we also wanted to expand further so we were raising some money in order to do some acquisitions. Um, and I suppose they were the two kind of big reasons really um, for going public for us. Your, your husband came on board at this stage, by this stage My he was working My husband came on board in 1996. And, um, Paul, I suppose, had a different skill set to me and had a huge impact on the business in that um, he now had worked with companies like KPMG and Intel and then with Gateway. So he'd seen things from the other side and looked at it very much from the point of view of the corporate trying to hire. And I suppose he understood. I had never really, other than my days in Xerox when I was selling, really dealt with big corporates in terms of, you know, that whole selling structure and, and, and how you... Uh, interact with them. So Paul was quite very influential in terms of bringing that side of the business on. In general terms, did you want to be your own boss? I think always. But yet in, in 99 when you floated the company, that was the last thing you were going to be because you now had to answer to a board, you had to answer to shareholders. That's right, but you're, being your own boss doesn't mean you're not answerable to somebody. You're always answerable. You know, whether you're answerable to yourself, to the bank, to a board, like you're always answerable to somebody. How do you find the board? How do you, how do you find it? Is it easy to you? Does it come easy to you to talk to a board, to talk to shareholders? Um, we have a really good board and um, they've been certainly very instrumental, I would say, also to, particularly in terms of the governance and growth of the company. And I think we're known as a company with strong values. You know, we'd be seen as pretty conservative in terms of um, how we handle our business. Um, and certainly the board have been great for me, they've been great advisors. You know, I, like really, I came out of college in 84, I was in business on my own by 89. I hadn't had what you'd call a lot of opportunity to um, get really deep experience, and the board have certainly been great for me in that way, in terms of tapping into really good and wise advice, I'd say. And I think the other thing that's really hard, and I think while it's great to see um, the kind of leadership um, the initiatives that are going on here in the university. It is very hard for um, small business owners and founders to tap into actually good leadership training, I would think. And I feel quite strongly about that. And I wish I had more of it early on in my career. We'll talk more about leadership in a moment, but let me take you to where the company is today. Just how big is the company today? So today we have just over um, 10,000 people working on client sites, both um, here in Ireland, in the UK, and across Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we have um, 750 internal employees. Um, we have 36 offices, 10 countries. Um, and 433 million pounds turnover. And revenue 400. That's not bad, Yeah, no, it's not too bad. <laughs> Can you become too big? Because you're opening up in America now, aren't you? Is yeah. there a danger of becoming too big? Is it a problem becoming big? Uh, I don't think it's about being big. It's about being the best. And that's always been our philosophy. And that's really about having the right people. You know, I know every office in our business, every division in our business, you can tell how it works by the people who are leading that division. I mean, it's just, it's, that's just what it's all about. Yeah. I must say that when, when you did float the company, you became the first... Irish woman who was uh, CEO, of, CEO a of, of a public company. Shocking, really. Isn't it? it? Shocking, absolutely yeah. shocking. Yeah. Has, any, has any followed in your footsteps since? Um, uh, there are a few, yeah, there Still are. Still very few? Though. There's very few, yeah, there's very few. It's just not, you know, the rate of progress is just not fast enough. Why is that? Um, look, I think there's, 
I don't think there's just one answer to that. I think there's several reasons, and there's lots of there's structural reasons. There's the way the corporate world works, um, and uh, you know. So, for example, careers work on moment. The way we're still, even though the world is changing with the technology, and actually it's changing fast. And I think it's one of the things that's very encouraging. Um, I think technology will liberate women even more in terms of their careers. But at the moment, careers still work in quite a hierarchical fashion a lot of the time, and they work on momentum. So when you're taking time out of your career, it, se it appears that it, would, that it still impacts your career. When you're taking time out to have children, it, it seems to me it still actually impacts your career, as much as we don't like to talk about that, or we don't like to say it. Um, but I do think, um, in some instances, it, can, it, it does impact. Um, I think also, too, that uh, things like the, um, I think the way we're structured in terms of childcare and um, family make it quite difficult for both parents to work. Um, and I think in that instant, quite often, it's the mother who ends up staying at home. And, you know, I, I've just said recently, certainly for us in the south of Ireland, if you combine the high rate, our high rate of tax, which is nearly 50%, with the fact that, uh, and the high cost of childcare, which is huge, um, like your second income um, is diminished by about 92%. So like that really means that, you, that a second parent has to stand back and think long and hard about working. How, how can we improve that? How can, how can we change things? Well, I think there's, there's lots of initiatives that can be taken uh, to change it. Um, I think, first of all, there should be, uh, you know, I, I think the government need to do something around more formal childcare structures. You know, we have lots of infrastructure in terms of our schools. Um, it's, it's actually nearly a bigger issue. Funny enough, when you have your children first, and this was my own experience, and you have them in full-time childcare, that's fine. Then you get to the stage where you send them to primary school, and suddenly they're finished at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. So now you can't really afford you almost have to pay as much as if they were in full-time childcare. So I think we could utilise, uh, there must be a way of utilising our schools that are empty um, in the afternoons in a much better way in terms of after-school care. And I think that's where the government need to step in and think about the infrastructure that we need. Other countries like Sweden, for example, do it very well. Sweden, on the other hand, too, they have, uh, they're advocating now that 40% of women should sit on boards. We're nowhere near that. No, but we have improved, but I still think there's a long way to go. I certainly think in the UK, the Lord Davies report has, has made an impact in that they set a target, and I think there's now, it's now 26% uh, women yeah. on boards in uh, the FTSE uh, companies. So I think, you know, and that's up from 11, 12% over the last four to five years. So that there has been progress. It's not enough, though. There's only four on your board. There's, no, there are, uh, actually, I'm the only female on my board. <laughs> I, we did have two. Um, well, I was thinking of IBEC, sorry, there's four oh, of them. Oh, on the IBEC board, yeah, yeah, there is yeah. four. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. And actually, uh, I got the opportunity, as president, I get the opportunity to nominate the vice president coming in, who then becomes the president, and that's a female as well. That's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> just going She's back on. Excellent. Uh, I bet. Uh, <laughs> Just going back, how did you cope with the family growing and the business growing at the same time? Well, what, what difficulties did you encounter? Oh, like it's just, you just live in a world of constant negotiation, really, <laughs> ultimately. Um, you have to, you know, um, so now I was lucky. I had good childcare and I suppose the business was doing well, so I was in a position that I could afford good childcare and that, that makes a huge difference. Um, but you know, it's still a negotiation. You're all the time rushing. You have to get home. It's deadlines, um, and the fact. And Paul was very supportive. So the fact that he was also working in the business made it gave us a bit more flexibility yeah. than most might have. Let's talk a little bit about IBEC and congratulations. You were appointed president last September, was it? That's last right. September. Yeah. How do you see your role? How do, what What is your role with IBEC? So. Um, my role as president of IBEC is really to support the board and to support businesses. What, business, what, what IBEC do is really they're a representative body for business and um, it's to support business and make sure that um, the business voice is heard in terms of the things that are 
essential, I suppose, not just for business, but for society as a whole. Like business have a lot of responsibility to the broader society as well. So in many ways, it's the IBAC down there, CBI here. That's right. What kind of relationship do the two organisations uh, have? The two organisations have an excellent relationship. And actually, we formed a uh, joint business council as far back as 1992. So businesses have been working very well on the island. And, you know, the IBEC and CBI very much have a shared vision um, for an all-island economy of 10 million people by um, 2050, by the mid-century. Um, that's prosperous and that has a good quality of life for people, really. And IBEC are, I suppose, very um, committed to that ideal and committed to working with the uh, CBI in terms of a connected economy. Has Brexit ruined many of the plans? Um, no, I don't think so. I think now more than ever, businesses need to work closely together. I think rather than, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of talk, you know, say, for example, um, the UK is our biggest market in the Republic in terms of exporting, and there's a lot of talk that we'll have to divert um, or, and try and transition from those markets to other markets. Now, that's not, first of all, that's not a simple thing to do. It takes a long time to build new markets. And, um, you know, we're very similar to the UK. Um, we find the UK very easy to do business with. And I actually think our, our emphasis needs to be on almost building stronger relationships. Of course, we have to open new markets too, but I think we should be looking, business should be looking to build stronger relationships and the same north and south. And actually, even at a university level as well, I think it's going to be really critical that there's rela really strong relationships at an education level on the whole island also too. But, uh, you know, with, with UK leaving the single market and, and the customs union, that must present a lot of problems for yourselves. It is. It's going to, it will present um, significant challenges for, for us. And um, I guess as business people, we're just going to have to uh, stay close to those challenges um, and work through them. Um, I think at the moment, it's virtually unforecastable. It's unknowable to know how this is going to turn out. Um, at the moment, you have a real sense of a sort of calm before the storm. The Irish economy is powering along. Um, I know when I talk to people here in Northern Ireland, they say things are great on the ground. In the UK, the consu you know, it's very much a consumer-driven um, recovery there, and things seem to be good. But nothing has happened yet. You know, uh, I think after Article 50 is triggered, when we start to see the impacts on trade, on the common travel area, I think, it's, to me, this looks like almost a can before the storm. What do you think of the common travel area? How do you think they're going to, to sort this? I really don't know. I think Nobody it looks knows. like a very don't challenging. Nobody knows. I back the CBI. I don't. I, no inkling no. of what's going to happen. Well, I think it's very important that the business voice is heard um, at the table because, at the end of the day, there's a lot of jobs depending um, on how. Uh, there's a lot of jobs depending on on how this is is sorted. Um, I mean, we've heard Theresa May say that uh, they're committed to the common travel area. Certainly, um, the Taoiseach has said the same. So I think everybody wants it. Uh, um, everybody wants trade to be able to move t freely. I think there's a big emphasis on the whole customs union side of things. We know, we all know what we want. Uh, the thing we have to try and understand now is how can we achieve it? And what part will the EU play in that? I mean, the EU have been um, pretty silent so far in terms of negotiations. So. Um, yeah, I think there are big challenges ahead for us. Well, there's talk that the UK and, and Northern Ireland will be slashing the corporation tax down to, to the level of the, the Republic, which is what, 12.5%? 12.5%, yeah. That's going to be a problem as well. There's going to be huge competition, is there not? Well, there's always competition. I think there's always competition. And um, I don't see that as the major challenge for us because I think, you know, our industrial policy for the last... 50 years has been built on foreign direct investment. And it is, while of course the tax rate is critically important, it's more than just tax. Um, you know, we also have a way of doing business. If you think about it, companies like IBM are in Ireland since the mid 50s, <coughs> Pfizer is there since the late 60s, Microsoft is there for 30 years. I mean, this, these are embedded um, with us. So 
uh, so there's real substance there, and I think that's the important thing. There's real substance. There's Irish people working right across those corporations globally, um, and um, certainly we'll have to compete and compete hard, but we'll compete on things like skills, education, um, you know, good legal system, good protection of intellectual property, um, good access to the European market, of course, which we will have. Um, and while no doubt it'll be challenging, we we'll have to continue to push the positives. That's what business has to do. In, in the context of corporation tax, many people, some people view the South as sort of tax haven. If we look at Apple, who should have, the government said they should have spent something like 13, the EU said they should have had something like 13 billion pounds in tax. Yeah. And I think they paid 0.005% in tax. Uh, are they tax compliant? Uh, I believe they are. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I I'm not privy to Apple's um, tax arrangements, but you know, my understanding is that um, our, uh, you know, uh, our revenue commissioner said they are that they were. Um, they set the rules, um, and I think the government had no choice but to challenge the EU ruling on the Apple ca tax case. I think also too um, the 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 international changes in tax law, um, you know, this whole um, consolidated tax base, the whole BEPS um, um, program that's coming in and that has, you know, things have changed since 2013. In some ways that might benefit Ireland mm -hmm. because it does mean that, that companies have to put substance where they're, um, where they're being taxed. And I think substance is important to us. It's important that that's what happens. Just one thing, Arlene Foster a few months ago uh, was sort of complaining that the Republic's political and, and business leaders were talking down Northern Ireland's uh, economy so that they could attract more business down there. How did you come across that? God, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have seen that at all. In fact, if anything, I would say there's a really acute awareness of the importance of trade between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. I, um, and, you know, I think it's interesting that the... Um, you know, the Irish government were out early in terms of trying to plan for this um, whole Brexit scenario. Um, and to do, I think we've got to look at what's best for the island as a whole. You know, we're a small island at the end of the day. We're on the edge of Europe. I think we've got, you know, that kind of thinking doesn't work to, for me. I think we've got to, to put the good of all the people on the island forward first. Brexit we sort of saw coming. Donald Trump, we didn't see coming. <laughs> Not to know. <laughs> how's, yeah. How is what he's been doing and saying these past few weeks, how's, how's it going to impact on us here in North and South? Um, again, hard to know. Um, you know, I think if he does some kind of tax rebate and the, the um, US corporations take their um, move to the trillions that they have sh sitting offshore back to the US. I don't think that's an issue. Uh, that won't be an issue. Um, I, I suppose my own belief is that in order to operate in a market, you need to be present in a market. So uh, therefore, I think the US multinationals who are in Ireland who want to sell into Europe need to be present in the market, and Ireland is a good place for them to be. But yet you and Packard yesterday are pulling out of leaf slip and, and kill there, they're, you're losing 500 jobs there. Is that the start of, of them moving away? I think that's particularly tough, but actually I think before, uh, before uh, Trump ever came into power, that was well yeah. signaled. So I think that has much more to do with um, technology and the way the world is moving. I mean, people aren't using printers now the way they used to. Um, so I think it has much more to do with that than it has to do with Trump, actually. I don't see that as related to Trump at all. Okay. This instance, anyway. So this America first thing, you don't think, you don't think they're all going to pull well, out? I certainly seven? wouldn't be complacent. I wouldn't be complacent about it. Um, I wouldn't be complacent about it. But you know, you've got to remember that Irish companies employ more people in the U.S. than U.S. companies employ in Ireland. Yeah. You know, which is quite like we don't advertise that nearly enough. Overall, then, maybe just to change subject and get a little bit more personal. How, how would you describe? your leadership style? I would say I'm collaborative. Um, I have huge belief and respect for the team that I work with um, and for their capability. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, that's how I, th I, in fact, I think about leadership much more about 
it, it's much more around relationships. Um, I think leadership is not really about your role or your title or what position you hold. It's much more about your ability to, to influence and to build relationships with others. Yeah. And I think if you can build good, strong relationships, then you can lead. CEOs nowadays, though, tend to be come from the accountancy background, the money background. Yeah. Uh, because the bottom line, that seems to be all that counts. You're more of a, a people's person, aren't you? Yeah, I definitely came through this. I think you see CEOs come through many different routes. You'll often see them come through the sales route. Uh, certainly, when times are tough, you see them particularly come through the account accounting yeah. route. But I think when you're in a more um, growth-focused phase, you'll see people come more from a sales. A lot of companies now, CEOs come through the engineering route. I mean, they come through many different routes. I don't really see it as kind of, you know, one particular type of role or skill set leads you to the CEO. Um, I think it's much more about the business, the type of company you are. Um, but is the bottom line always the most important line? Well, there's always competing things, but you know, if you don't deliver, um, you can't do, you know, if you're not profitable and not delivering, you can't do very much, you know, either for your people or for your customers or for anybody else. So, I mean, fundamentally, you've got to be profitable. How has your style changed over the past 20 odd years that you started it? Well, I've learned a lot. Um, I've learned a lot over the last uh, number of years. I, um, uh, I think I've probably become a bit more decisive than I would have been. I'd have taken a long time thinking about things, you know, before making decisions. So I think I might have become a bit more decisive. Um, I think uh, I absolutely understand now that the most important thing a leader has to do is to put the right people in the right jobs. Like, I don't think there's any, you know, as a leader, you make your life so much easier if you, put, if you have the right people around you. And are you good at delegating? And is delegation important? I'm better than I used to be, <laughs> for sure. And um, uh, I think delegation is hugely important because I see delegation almost like empowerment, empowering people. So I think if you believe in people and believe in, your, in their capability, you've got to empower them to get on with the job. I think you know, people need clarity about what needs to be done. And, but then once they know what needs to be done and they're good at it, they wouldn't be in the role if they weren't good at it. You've got to let them on. What advice would you give to, to young people today starting out? Because it's still a difficult work situation out there. What, what advice would you give to the young entrepreneur or just the young person starting out in business? I would say do your best and then let yourself off the hook. You know, you just give, give it your best, no matter what job you're doing, whether it's, you know, whether you're working a part-time role, um, whether it's your first job, whatever it is, do your best, stay completely open to learning. I think learning is a huge, you just, we just all, and particularly in the world today, um, where we're seeing so many jobs disappearing with automation and stuff like that, I think we don't, re we haven't fully gotten our heads around what's coming down the tracks. Uh, to us with, with the advances, advances in technology. So I just think that willingness to learn, the, you know, is really important. So there would be the two things, do your best and be willing to learn. Stay curious. I think that's... And not be it. frightened of failure? Absolutely not. You know, I mean, there's... Does failure worry you? No, in some ways, there's no such thing as failure, really. Um, provided you handle it well and and you're, you think about it as an opportunity to learn. I mean, nobody ever gets it right all the time. I certainly don't. Um, but as long as you think about it, you know, at the end of your day, as long as you think, what went right today? What could I have done better? What did I learn from it? You know, I think you'll steer a fairly even path. What was the toughest part over the past 20, 30 years for you? I think the first recession, <laughs> So I've been through two pretty major ones. So the first one after the dot com, um, I, I remember one of our advisors. So the, so we went public in ninety nine. Technology was the place to be. Um, couldn't be better. Everything was riding high. And then within about a year, the whole thing crashed. So you're suddenly trying to deal with all this, and you're also trying to deal with the fact that you're in the public eye as well. So everybody can see every mistake you make. And um, I remember one of my advisors sitting across the table from me and just saying, like, Anne, you'd be better off getting out of this now. Like, you just think about it, you're going to work for the next 10 years just to get back to where you, are, where you were 
last year. And then what? And that was, you know, that was pretty tough, but I'm not a quitter. <laughs> <laughs> You're very steely feisty. Well, <laughs> and you'll tell you. <laughs> What's been your, your greatest achievement, do you think? Um, I think in business, if it's in business, um, if it's in business, it's definitely the team that I have around me, um, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I think, in terms of personal life, my two kids, fabulous. For your age, what, 21 uh, 21 and 14, and 14 yeah. And what, what are they doing with their lives? Following uh, your mum's footsteps and dad's footsteps? Uh, not really. Amy is doing um, law and business in Trinity, and I don't know what she'll do after that. And then um, Peter's just doing his junior cert, and he just wants to be a chess player. <laughs> so he just wants to be a chess player. <laughs> Where do you see the business going in the next five, ten years? What are your plans for the future? Um, well, as you said earlier, we're opening in the States um, in March. And uh, I'd like us to uh, continue to grow our presence here on this island. Um, I think there's a good opportunity for us in the UK, depending on you know how things happen. Um, and I'd also uh, like us to see, see us getting some good market share in the US. You can't win many more awards, can you? <laughs> oh, well. Awards are much more business about the and team. finance, oh, business person of the year. You've won the Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, you've won the Image Businesswoman of the Year. Uh, yeah, but that's you know, like at the end of the day, I wouldn't be winning any of those. I'm only collecting them on behalf of the team at CPL, and that's actually the reality of it. Um, because without the team, without them growing the business, I wouldn't be really, you know, that's. They're the facts. Very modest, then. Well, you know. <laughs> any any secret little uh, guilty pleasures? <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking, thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Only she's not you're wearing them today. About my shoes. She wears Christian Louboutin shoes. For the men in here, you don't have a clue what that means. The women, the women know exactly what it means. And if you see a wee red sole, you'll know all about it. But you know wee red soles on today. No. <laughs> no. And I think uh, we'll open up for questions because I'm sure there are much more intelligent questions uh, to come from, from, the, uh, from the audience. Now, Fergal has introduced a, a, an innovation this year. Normally, we get a microphone going round and it takes time to set it up. We now have a ball with a microphone in it. Fergal discovered this in a hall or somewhere one night. <laughs> and if you want to ask a question, put your hand up and we will throw the ball to you. You turn it around to the little black spot and there's a microphone in it. And we could set the business up doing this. Have you ever recruited the wrong person within your own organization? And how did you deal with it? Did you manage them out? Or did you work with them and move them aside? Yeah, um, I have recruited. Uh, I have recruited the, 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 on occasion the wrong person. I mean, the one thing about recruitment is it's not an exact science, and uh, you do get much better at it. And the important thing is that you're making more right decisions. You know that you're that you're tipping the balance in the right direction there. But I think the most important thing of all is to very quickly, if the person isn't right for the organisation, make that decision very quickly, uh, and help them move on to something else. Anyone else think there's people over here? Go on, throw it. We got about cracking. You know? <laughs> yes. You can see I love sport. Um, Anne, will you sp speak a little bit about how you moved your business from the, the traditional of just recruitment, people in, put them into jobs, uh, to what you, you did uh, in relation to extending the services you gave to or give to customers, as in how you end up with 10,000 people on site, the type of uh, services you offer to employers. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. it does indeed. So, um, so if, you think about how the, um, if you think about how the world of employment is changing, actually, at the moment before our very eyes, um, people want to work on a much more flexible basis. So, um, individuals for lots of different reasons. It may be that they're studying, it may be work-life balance uh, reason, it may be d um, to do with family life or whatever. Um, people much more now uh, want to work on a flexible basis. 
As well as that, at the same time, um, the large corporates also want flexibility to meet the peaks and troughs of demands for their services and products. And therefore, they like to keep about 20, what we would see with, a lot, um, with most of the big, bigger companies is they like to keep about 20% of their people on a flexible basis. Now, that can be anything from um, um, a temp, you know, somebody just working on a temporary basis uh, right through to fully outsourcing a function. And we want to be able to work with our customers right along that whole continuum. So everything to do with the whole people process. So right from putting the person in a permanent job, supplying them with one or two people on a temporary basis, or right up to fully outsourcing um, a function for them. Uh, and we, we do each of that along the way. So for example, um, we would run a number of shared services centers for some of our clients. We employ the staff, uh, we manage them, and um, we deliver the service then to our client, or indeed sometimes to their end clients, um, whichever it is. And that's how we've ended up right along that, that continuum. And actually, I think that's an area of our business that will continue to expand because it's been interesting. People always say, oh, recruitment business, you're a lead indicator of where the economy is <coughs> at. And that actually has always traditionally been the case because what you see happening is when the economy downturns, the first thing um, companies do is they let uh, people go who are working with them on a temporary basis. Then they let them next, it's their, uh, or they stop hiring on a permanent basis. Then they let people go who are working on a temporary basis with them. Then they cut into their own uh, staff and let uh, people go there. But when you go into recovery mode, the first thing they do is they start to hire people back on a temporary basis, then they start to move into hiring people permanently. Um, what was very interesting though for us as a company in the last recession, which was really tough in the whole um, banking um, global recession, our permanent placement business fell off a cliff. Now our temporary and contract and outsourcing business certainly reduced as well. It, it dropped by about 18, 19%. But it very quickly started to grow again, even actually through the recession. So it was much more resilient. And, and I think that's because of the trend towards much more flexible working. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, where's, the, where's our football? Yeah, go on. There we go. Well done. Um, apart from Jerry Kelly, who <laughs> inspires you and why and what qualities do they have? Um, I suppose my mother has really been the biggest inspiration for me and the kind of qualities that come to mind was her absolute, you know, she was really committed to integrity. Integrity was a huge value of hers. Uh, so that part of building your character um, and uh, being really ethical and straight about what you do. In the world of business, who inspires you? Oh gosh, <laughs> um, there, I just have a whole range of people. Uh, there's a whole range of people um, who inspire me in business. I suppose um, a lot of the women that I work with on uh, the, in the 30% Club and on the Women's Executive Network, some of the really good work um, that they're doing, um, I think then a lot of other, um, you know, I think anyone who has built a business or achieved good success in their career, I admire really. Thank you. Anyone else? Far? We'll go, and then we'll go. Right across. <laughs> well done. <laughs> It takes an arm, I'm on the sort of thing. No, used, used to, not now. Where, where do you stand in zero hour contracts? Um, zero hour contracts are an issue if they're abused. But actually, um, my experience has been, and there's been a study done in the Republic, um, and zero hour contracts really haven't been uh, aren't a significant issue there. Uh, I think in the UK, zero hour con contracts have been a much bigger issue. Um, I think that they're used properly and uh, 
businesses and people have the flexibility that's required from them, they can be fine. Um, I uh, just said, uh, uh, how do you relax now? <coughs> how do you get away from it all? Um, mostly with family, actually. Uh, mostly with family and uh, good friends. Um, uh, yeah, family and good friends, really. But you're sorry now you let it go in 1989. <laughs> 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 uh, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute joy talking to you. Would you please give a round of applause for us. Uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor Professor Alistair Adair, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the outset, on your behalf and on behalf of the team PKFFPM, I would like to express our heartfelt appreciation to Anne Hardy for sharing our inspirational approach to leadership and indeed, I think, through the question and answer session as well, uh, how she responded to various different challenges throughout her career. And that whole area of it's all about relationships and people development. Uh, and certainly, she was a very uh, Great choice as our sixth annual leadership talk and key speaker. Thank you very much. It's obvious uh, that this morning's discussion, uh, from this morning's discussion, that uh, the long for born lady now based in Dublin. And by the way, Joe Woods, I think with Joe Woods, I didn't see him, I heard the voice. My father was a blacksmith, so there you are. Who um, <laughs> began her career in the Xerox, where she was one of Ireland's first tele sales workers, as she told us. Subsequently moved to Graf and Recruitment, and it is great to see the joint founder of Graf and Recruitment here today at Ken Bell Show, where she began that 30 year career in the recruitment sector and the creation of, as we've heard now, that the international CPL coded on both the Irish and the London Stock Exchanges. But certainly, people centered on passion. That, and I thought some of the things that I thought came through today was well, she was trying to suggest I think that people should back themselves. You know, they don't have to be born entrepreneur. They can back themselves, believe in themselves, and ultimately believe in their ideas. And Alan's passion for business aligned to a clear set of values, which she referred to again this morning. Her values it was clearly evident this morning. I thought as she traced her career from Teddy Sales to, come, to becoming that first first female CEO of an Irish public PLC. And she shared with us the over 10,000 uh, people working in climate projects, the 433 million euros, a lot of money. <laughs> CEO of a company, 433 million euros, and her great team around her. And I think it was refreshing to reflect on Anne's comment about Anne Wright. I think she said, there is no such thing as failure. Fantastic comment. I think what she was also implying was that success and failure are two sides of the same coin. Just experience it, and she kept putting it. I think Jerry had said her a few times it was a problem. I noticed she shifted the feet a wee bit and she referred to challenges, but always challenges. She relished uh, addressing challenges with positivity. Um, it is fitting also that Anne's success in business world has been widely recognised, as she was uh, quite humble about, with prestigious awards virtually matched by no other Irish person at present. Uh, Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2006. Finance and Business Person of the Year in 2014, and Image Business Woman of the Year in 2015, not to mention the President of IBEX, which has already been referred to last September. Yes, Anne Hardy is a true international leadership success who carries her success very lightly. And in any review of Ireland's distinguished visionary and business entrepreneurs, the name of Anne Hardy will be recognised as a pioneer and a trailblazer for Irish business and Irish businesswomen. How privileged and indeed honoured we all are to have been in Anne's presence today. Thank you again. Uh, it takes two to chat. I'm sure you'll all agree that Jerry Kelly gave us another uh, power excellent performance this morning. And really it's fair to say that Central to his enormous achievements in broadcasting is the man himself, uh, Jerry Kelly. And once again, uh, his class and attention to detail in terms of research and delivery were clearly demonstrated in the exquisite performance. Thank you, Jerry, for making such a <laughs> Listening and observing Anne Hurdy, thankfully I believe that there are some similarities with PKFFPM 
and are caring and people uh, centered culture. And our desire to attract the brightest and the best, and we just, we were saying differently, we call it right people, right seats. Uh, we are greatly honoured to uniquely uh, being the current holder of both the UK Accountancy Employer of the Year and the Irish uh, Employer of the Year, uh, both prestigious awards. And F PKFFPM are delighted to be part of the PKF network, who have been named as the fastest growing major accountancy network in the UK and Ireland, according to last Friday's Accountancy Magazine uh, publication. It's an exciting time to be part of the PKF family in both Ireland and the UK. We're growing faster than anyone else because we're investing in our operations, introducing additional service lines where we see opportunities to help clients, uh, and obviously also trying to raise at all times our level of client service. Our, our current theme continues to be humility, trying to see how we can do things better. Yes, as Anne referred to, Brexit may be dominating the headlines, but it's not the only issue that business should be planning for at the moment. Preparing a succession plan for, for the future and protecting your business against a cyber crime, we suggest, should also be top priorities. It is estimated that two thirds of businesses were hit by cyber crime last year. The problem is so serious that the PK of FPM recently set up a dedicated cyber team to assist clients. For dedicated team deals with Brexit. And I highlight our forthcoming cyber security breakfast seminar to be held in Belfast on the 22nd of February here, and the opportunity to meet one of the most feared hackers in the world, I'm told, Darren Martin. I'm looking forward to meeting him. We'll learn a few things from there. <laughs> we, are we, we, are, we were delighted and indeed honoured to host uh, this leadership talk this morning in association with our fellow uh, manager leadership network champion, organization, the Ulster University Business School, as part of the MNM uh, Management Month. It was a great privilege to work closely with Professor Mark Durkin, Executive Dean, Dean of the Ulster University Business School, in the organization of today's event. And I'd like to publicly thank him for all his guidance and support, and through him, all his colleagues. I am very conscious, God help me, I don't know how to ask you, but I'm very conscious as a member of the Ulster University um, business School Advisory Forum, I have to be careful to see my chairman sitting down here, that the, uh, we call it for short the UUBS, it has developed a very exciting new strategic entrepreneurial plan in the context of the university's 5 and 50 uh, strategic priorities. Congratulations also to the Management Leadership Network and our fellow champion organizations, many represented here today, under the direction of Bill Monson, Bill I'd like to try to call them, but okay. Since they built all of them work, he told me they don't try it. <laughs> As a result, I panicked. There's a few mics sitting around there, but we didn't have to use them. They've all worked all right. Uh, and to be fair, they've been on the team. They put together a phenomenal and very exciting uh, program of events. One yesterday, I'd see a full of speakers here today in the murder, uh, for February's Management Month uh, initiative. You'll appreciate uh, that events like this uh, just don't happen. And in respect of the food and hospitality, we thank Jennifer Campbell and our student team at the University of Calgary Western. In terms of the University Administration, we thank Maureen Fox and Gillian Webb and the Facilities Management Team. In terms of ICT and audio, we thank Chris Paul and his team. We'd also like to acknowledge the PR and media support of Jane Wells from Jacobs. We'd like to thank Simon Mooney and Mooney Media for all their assistance in terms of design, printing and artwork, and also uh, Darren McCoy for the video. And, and not forgetting uh, our very well dapper photographer, you may notice me, doesn't like wearing ties, there aren't many, but he wants you to notice his, his jackets because he's a different way of Whatever about uh, Anne wearing Christian Louboutin shoes, <laughs> I haven't got a chance to look at Darren's shoes yet, but I will assure you they're normally quite special. <laughs> uh, I think you would agree uh, we're very fortunate to be entertained. Uh, the beautiful music down the registration reception this morning to the Arco uh, String Quartet, and again, uh, we thank them for their lovely music. Indeed, I'm conscious, as I get up each morning, how fortunate and honoured I am to lead a positive team PKFFPM. I mean, we, we call the team <coughs> working together, everybody achieves more. And once again, I'd like to thank all my colleagues for their tremendous support, led by my staff director, colleague Teresa Campbell, and our events manager, Lauren Quinn in the organization of today's PKF FP In terms of thanks, finally, I would like to thank you for coming along in such great numbers and ensuring a full house 
within a few days of the invitations being issued. Before concluding, for those who have been here before, I have one nice duty to do at the present. Very careful, isn't it? Better explain this. The lady caught on her in here. Believe it or not, oh, she didn't wear them today. You see that bit of red? Pushing, <laughs> her pushing and putting shoes high on the table. She didn't tell you today, but I think she's an avid skier. I don't think I know it in her family. So a set of skis on the table. She told you how important her family were to her. You can see Amy and Peter, then picture on the desk. And another little picture of Paul her husband, or Paul her husband, who's been sent from to life and the business. We couldn't get Ballon and Ray to be fair. We weren't, we weren't sure there was a street in Ballon and Ray, but what we have is dead, and sorry. Certainly said, remind me, I married a lady from Swatter, but I, when I was curtain, I was doing an order up in the <laughs> Austin's of the Diamond, or Austin's of Love Diamond. I remember it was a. Good Friday, and I rang my wife to be on. I said, uh, I'm trying to get directions to get from Derry to Swatter. And she said, You need to be very careful. There's a rally going through the main street. I said, ah, There only is one street. <laughs> 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 I haven't lived a time with it, but actually, Longford Town, a picture of Longford Town oh, yes. to connect Anne to reach to Longford. You can see the, uh, the CPM and the IPEC load. The acknowledgement of Anne is very aware. <coughs> Anne, she's a very astute reader and interest in her affairs. So we've got the Irish Times for you. Huh? And on the Irish Times we have the, the lead stories are Longford Woman, the CP and the Sources Founder, the new president of the IMAC. And we also have uh, the Rockland here. So with all these things, don't forget the PGMFP. <laughs> I should acknowledge the artist Brett and Pierce from Dublin. Uh, a unique piece. Thank you all very much. Another very memorable event, and we thank you for joining us on such a large number. Thank you.